So anyway, anyway, I think that I think that you guys. I'm really hoping that you guys get a lot out of this. Um, it's a it's a simple, straightforward message. It's not nothing too complicated, nothing too crazy. We are going to be continuing with our sermon series uh, called "The Heart of God." How many of you guys have been liking the sermon series we're doing? Anybody? All right, it's about half. I'll take that as a win. Halfway. Yes. Oh I've probably been talking about David. He's um, so if you guys have been here, like I said, we've been doing our sermon series called The Heart of God. We've been looking at the life of David. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. So we're looking at what characteristics did David have that we can learn from so that we can have and we can become people after God's own heart. That's progress. That's perfect. Um, that's nice. It's not even 4K. It's cool. cheaper than <laughs> And so, um, and so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. We're going to be continuing with that sermon series. If you remember, a couple weeks ago, um, a couple weeks ago, I, I talked about insecurity, and I talked about how David was secure in his Savior. When you realized that you were so All right. It's not like this is endgame. I don't know what it says. It's nothing crazy. But... But if you're here, you, you remember that we talked about um, insecurity, and then Grace talked about being bold, and how when you're bold, people see God. And then we, how many of you guys like John? Did you guys like John last week? He was good. I love him. I love him. Too. I follow him on Instagram. He's a good guy. You yes, should follow him. I just him. Wait, who's John? No, John. I have kid who's brother. I guess. Yeah, the brother. So he was awesome. Oh, Grace is great. Oh, my God. And so, uh, and so he, talk, he talked about passion. And so tonight, I'm going to talk about mercy. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about mercy. And so this is my main idea right here, is that David was a man after God's own heart. David had God's heart because he had mercy on his enemies. So if you guys want to open with me to 1 Samuel chapter 24. All uh, right, we got Bibles. Okay, it's coming. It's coming. So real quick, just listen up. I'm going to give you just a recap. So if you guys were here, you remember that me and Grace, we both talked about David and Goliath. We talked about that, that um, story of David and Goliath. And then, um, you know, John came in and he talked about a story when, when um, David was king. And so where we are now, where we're reading in this story now, uh, is right in between those two events. It's right after David and Goliath and right before David now, becomes king. where were we? We're in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24. And we're reading verses 4 through 7. So we know we're right in between uh, David and Goliath and David becoming king. And so uh, and so after David killed Goliath, for those of you who don't know, some of you, most of you probably do. 24. 24. 24. Most of you probably know, but um, after David killed Goliath, he had a long uh, season in his life where he was a very, very successful military commander. And so he goes off and he's having incredible victories over the Philistines. And, and all of Israel is in love with David and everybody loves him. And they start to love him more than Saul. <coughs> they start to love him more than Saul. And Saul was the king at the time. And so Saul became incredibly, incredibly jealous of David. To the point, to the point where he was trying to kill him. There was even a couple times when, when David was playing his harp over there for the king. And Saul picked up a spear and threw it at him, trying to pin him to the wall. And David evaded. And so, so he, David has to run away. So he's running away from, from the king of Israel, who's trying to kill him. And where we pick up here, they, uh, Saul had 3,000 men going after him. And he finds out that he's in this town. So on the way to the town, Saul has to pee. I'm not kidding. That's literally what it says. He has to pee. And so he goes into this cave. I mean, I guess maybe he's pooping, I don't know. But he, he has to go to the bathroom, so he goes into this cave to relieve himself. And this is where we're going to pick up in, in, in verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Now uh, now David and his men were sitting in the, in the innermost parts of the cave. Um, and, and the men of David said to him, Here is the day which the Lord said to you. Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as, as, as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And, uh, and afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. 
He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to, to my Lord and the Lord and the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing that he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words, and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. So we see that this act was an incredible act of mercy. It was an incredible thing. And so I want to title my message tonight, Mirroring Mercy, or Mercy Mirroring. What do you guys like better here? Mirroring Mercy. mercy. Oh, yeah. Oh, guys, that was mine, and he told me I was I wrong. liked Mercy Mirroring better, <laughs> so we were fighting about it, so we just put them both up. Happy All right, fine. Mercy. Mirroring Mercy is the title of our message tonight. Oh, yeah. I told you. Mirroring <laughs> Mercy. Mercy mirroring? So okay. David was, like I said... Without having mercy... Mirroring Yeah, I know, I know. Listen, speaking, it's verb. So mercy. That's why Grace did like it. But anyway, anyway, anyway. So what we're looking at tonight is that David was a man after God's own heart. Or David had the heart of God because he had mercy on his enemies. Has anyone ever been hurt by someone before? Anyone at any point in your life? Yeah, there, there's nobody in here who can keep your hands up. We've all been hurt by people. Grace is pointing at me right now. We've all, and I'm looking at you. We've all got the same thing in mind. Wow. We've all, we've all hurt each other. We've all been hurt by people. And, and so we have a problem. Uh, yeah, no problem uh, okay, guys, come on. Okay, guys, come on, guys. I know it is. A lot of energy tonight. Okay. So, um, so everybody's been hurt by someone before. And so we know if our mission is to pursue God and love people, we know that we cannot truly love people if we're not going to show mercy on those who have hurt us. And so that's the whole idea about what we're going to be talking about tonight is how can we get to the point where we can be just as merciful to other people as David was to Saul in this moment. So I just want to pray and then we'll jump right into it, okay? So Jesus, I just thank you for this opportunity to preach your word. God, I pray that your word would flow through me. God, I just pray that you would encourage us tonight, um, lift us up, build us up. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, guys. I've said it before, I'll say it again, every single week if I have to, I love Disney movies. <laughs> I love Disney movies. So one of my favorites, it, my number one favorite might be The Lion King, but, but one of my favorites, and I'm... And I, I am a proud Disney fan. I'm not one of those that like hide in the corner. Obviously, no. yeah. I preach about it almost every week. So you know I love Disney movies and I'm proud of it. But one movie that I love, that I'm not so proud to admit about, but it's probably in my top five, is Beauty and the Beast. Hey, that's absolutely, amazing. absolutely top five. Oh, yeah. Definitely my, my, my favorite, my definitely my favorite princess movie oh, yeah. is Beauty and the Beast. Oh, my favorite scene in that whole movie is when Gaston finally dies. Yes! I, I love that. that part! I hate Gaston. He he's, he's the worst. And I think that there, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, where, where all throughout the movie, you know, the writers of the movie are building him up to be this horrible person that you just hate so much. And then there's this super satisfying ending where he dies. And, um, and I, I just think that I just think that even in general, there's something so satisfying about a terrible villain finally getting what he deserves and being defeated. There's something so satisfying when a villain is defeated. Hey, could you show this quick clip? Yeah. We're gonna watch it. You can yeah, start like, it from where we got home. Oh yay! You should be the one to Stop! <laughs> I was going to say it next 
chasing after this poor innocent beast and who's misunderstood. He didn't do anything wrong, guys. And, and, and all throughout the movie. No, he didn't. He just kidnapped this girl and wouldn't let her leave. Alright, guys, it's a Disney movie. I mean, he just shunned the lady Well, yeah, in the beginning, obviously. But, but he never, you know, Belle loved him and she wanted to stay with him. And and, and so and so all throughout the movie, um, Gaston... Wow, that was the most impressive thing I've ever heard. Um, so, so, so he's he's fighting and he and he's and he's trying to kill this innocent beast this whole time, and um, and so that's why it's my favorite clip because it's so satisfying. This whole time the beast is fighting in self defense and then he gets him and he shows him mercy and he just tells him just get out of here. I'm not gonna kill you. Just get out of here. And the guy still comes back, and he stabs him in the in the back, um, cheap shot, and 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 so then eventually he dies, and we realize that it's so satisfying because he got what he deserved. That's the whole idea: is that he got what he deserved, and really Saul, in a lot of ways, was a lot like Gaston. Saul was a lot like Gaston. The first time that we ever hear Saul mentioned in the Bible. Um, you know, the Bible says that, that he was a head taller than everyone else in Israel. He was big and strong and powerful. He was a war leader. He was a military commander. And, and, and he did some terrible things. And he was cocky and conceited and prideful. And he had an ego. And nobody liked him except, you know, all the people who he was lying and deceiving to, you know. And so, and so eventually, so he's a lot like Gaston in that way. And then, um, and so basically, we get to this point where David has the opportunity to kill him. And what you don't realize when you're just reading those few verses is that David had every right to kill Saul in that moment. He had every right to kill Saul in that moment. Saul was completely out of, out of line by trying to kill David. David had done nothing wrong. He had done nothing but save Saul and honor Saul. And still, Saul is completely delusional and jealous and filled with rage and anger and so he's trying to kill David completely innocent man and so David he has every right to kill him and still he shows him mercy so that's where we're going with it tonight still he shows of course he had a right to kill him it would have been self-defense Saul was attacking him with 3,000 people he was completely innocent of course, you have a right to kill somebody in that in that in that situation. But he, but he shows that he has the heart of God. He shows that he has the heart of God in that moment because he shows mercy on Saul. Do you ever do you ever overestimate yourself? Have you ever overestimated yourself? You think you're super good at something, but then you turn out to not be mediocre. You turn out to not even be mediocre. No. So, this is not a story that I am super happy to be sharing with you, but it's a true one, so I'll share it. A couple months ago, me and Grace went mini golfing for the first time. Oh no, I got it too. I didn't go mini golfing. A couple months ago, me and Grace went mini golfing for the first time as a couple. First time we ever went together. And I mean, I, I'm an athlete. I was always good at sports. I'm like, I'm destroy 
later. I was talking trash the whole time. I was, I was figuring I was, I would have this game locked away halfway through. There's no way. Uh, but of course, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna keep score. Now I'm gonna destroy her. I'm gonna destroy her. I was completely overestimating myself because by the time we counted up our scores, she beat me. She beat me fair and square. Did you hit Every single thing I do, I always overboast how good I am. And, and then when they beat me, I just like, like yeah, I was just I feel like we all have a natural tendency to overestimate ourselves, yeah. to think that we're better than we are, yeah. to think that we're more accomplished or more talented or better in any way or another than we actually are. We have a hard time humbling ourselves and saying, uh, "You're right. I'm really not. I'm really not as good as I as I would like to be, or as I think I am." And I think that often we do that with the Bible too. And so we read stories like this, and we see David performing this incredible godly act of mercy and sparing Saul, and we put ourselves in his shoes. And we're like, I think I could do it. I think I could spare him. I think that in that situation I would spare him. Like, like you guys were saying, like, is it really justified for him to kill him? Yeah, it was. And, and you're like, I think that I would do it too. But the reality is this. The reality is this. We're not David. We're not David. We are Saul. When God, when God orchestrated this whole thing, when, when this all happened, God put this in the Bible. I think that this is the reason that God put this story in the Bible. To show us the kind of mercy that he was going to display to us. You see, we are not David in this situation. We're not the one who have people coming to us and are trying to kill us. And we get this amazing opportunity to be like... You know what? You deserve death, but I'm going to give you life. We don't have that opportunity. More often than not, we're not David. The reality of the situation is that we're not David. We are Saul. God had mercy. God has mercy on us the way David had mercy on Saul. God had mercy on us the way David had mercy on Saul. Listen, guys, this is the gospel. Actually, it's not so just the gospel is like, uh, stop. You want to come on. That no. is absolutely not true. The gospel starts in the book of Genesis. <laughs> but we can talk about that later. <clears throat> Guys, this is the gospel. This no, is what the gospel no, is all no, about. You, you have sinned. Every single one of you has no, sinned. No. <clears throat> You've all sinned. Every one of you has sinned. And you're all deserving of death. I hear a lot of people say to me all the time, well, why is there such a heavy price to pay for, for lying, for sinning? How is it possible that if I tell a little white lie, I'm really deserving of death? Well, guys, let me tell you, sin is repulsive to God. And I don't just mean that he looks at it and says, ew. I mean it actually repulses him. It repels him away from you. Sin cannot... Hang on, guys. Hang on, guys. Listen, this is important. Sin cannot exist in the presence of God. You want to know why God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden way back in Genesis? Yes. It's because the physical presence of sin cannot exist in the physical presence of God. How is it's, Satan there? It's reality. See, it's different. Satan, that's a totally different. We can talk about that. That's a How totally different track. There? But, but sin cannot exist in the presence of God. Snack. If sin had existed in the presence of God, it would be annihilated like a germ in a bucket of bleach. And so God had to kick out Adam and Eve so that he could save him, so that he could save them. And so when you see that, you see, when you sin, what you're doing is you're actually pushing God further away from you. And so why does sin result in death? Because the Bible says that God is the source of life. God is life and the source of all life. And so if your sin is pushing away God, your sin is actually pushing away life. Your, your sin is actually pushing away life itself. And so God, in his mercy, sent Jesus so that he would die on the cross. So that although you sin and you've pushed away life and you're deserving of death, Jesus came and he suffered and died and was crucified and paid that price for you. He died in your place so that you wouldn't have to. So now I know that we all die physically, but now we can survive spiritually. That's what the gospel is all about. God showed us mercy when we didn't deserve it. God showed us grace when, he, when we didn't deserve it. That's what the gospel is all about. It's all about mercy. <clears throat> and so here's my main point. My one point, my only point. 
When you realize that you're Saul and not David, you gain the ability to be David and not Saul. Let me say that again. When you realize that you're Saul and not David, you gain the ability to be, to be David and not Saul. So now let me explain. Colossians 3.13. If you want to go there now, you can. I've got it right here. Uh, I'm just reading the second half of the verse. It's a short verse. It says this. It says this. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. I don't know if, if you guys, uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you know one of these kind of people. You, does any of you know one of those people who are just completely and ridiculously generous? Every, I feel like everybody knows one of those people. For me, yeah. it was John, the kid who preached here last week. He is the most generous person that I have ever met in my life. He's the kind of person who goes, you know, goes above and beyond tipping 100% at restaurants. Or he's like, you know, paying the person, uh, paying for the person's coffee behind him in Starbucks and stuff like that. You know, we, I feel like we all know one of those people. I am not one of those people, unfortunately. I'm working on it, I'm trying. I know that most of you are not one of those people. Uh, oh, called you out. I'm just kidding. Yes, I'm just kidding. Sometimes. I know that you are. I know that you are. And I want you to be. It's a really good thing. And so, and so we all know one of those people who's like ridiculously generous. But John was my best friend before I knew Jesus. John was my best friend before I was saved. And let me tell you something. There was never any time before I knew Jesus that I was more generous than when I was hanging out with John. There's something about being around people like that, seeing people be generous, seeing people be generous to you. John was always paying for my stuff. He was always paying ridiculous things, like he paid for the conference that I went to where I met Jesus at. It was like a $200 conference, and he just paid for it for me. And so there's something about being around people who are generous that makes you want to then go and be generous too. You don't want to feel like free and exactly. Like and that's one of the reasons why God is so merciful to us. That's the main reason, obviously, is just because He loves you. He loves you so much and He wants to establish relationship with you. And so when you don't deserve it, God is merciful. And when you deserve to be punished, God takes the punishment away. But there's also the side of it that this is this is good. So if you're writing, if you're taking notes, write this down. What God has done to you, He wants to do through you. What God has done to you, He wants to do through you. And it, it, it applies to everywhere in life. I've talked about it with love a lot, but it applies to love, it applies to peace, patience. You list any of the fruit of the spirits. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There you go, Abby. Um, I was you know. my have a book. Yeah, and so, and so it works for any of those, it works for anything. Everything that God wants to give you, He wants to give you for yourself, but He wants to give it to you more than that so that you can share it with other people. And so when God is merciful to you, it's because He wants you to then go out and be merciful to other people. Um, when you realize that you were worthy of death, when you deserve death, and God spared you, it changes the way you see other people when they wrong you. Because you've been forgiven such an amazing debt, how could you not then go and forgive others? I don't know exactly where it is, but it's so, um, in, the, in the New Testament there's a parable, and it's a very popular parable. I'm not sure which, uh, which book it's in. But basically it's, it's called the, uh, the parable of the wicked, wicked servant. And basically it's this story about this servant, and he has this incredible debt against his master. He owes the, the master like a million dollars. And the master says, you know what? I forgive you. You don't owe me anything. And then the servant goes out to another servant, one of his buddies, who owes him like five bucks. And he says, go pay me the five dollars that you owe me. After he was just, just forgiven his debt of like a million dollars, he goes and says to this other servant, go pay me your five dollars that you owe me. And, and when, he, when he couldn't do it, he was, he was wicked and he was resentful and he, was, you know, he sent him to jail. And when, when the master who originally forgave this servant found out about this, he was like, you wicked servant, I forgive you so much. How could you hold such a small debt against someone, uh, against someone else? How could you do that when I've forgiven you so much? And I think that God is saying the same thing to us today. God has forgiven us such an incredible debt. And there's some of you in this room, maybe you're holding back 
You're holding a grudge against someone. You're holding something against someone, and 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 you're not you're not willing to be merciful. You're not willing to forgive them. Maybe they did wrong you, and I'm not saying that they didn't. But when you've been forgiven such an incredible amount, the way that God has forgiven you, how can you then go and hold a grudge, hold something against someone else who's 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 hurt you in just a small way? You have to realize that the way that people hurt us in this world is so insignificant compared to the way that we hurt God by our sin. Our sin is what killed Jesus. Our sin is what put him on the cross. That's the price that was that that our sin um, had to be paid for with. And so when we when we look at that and we acknowledge that, but then we say, no, I'm not going to forgive you when, when all you did was lie to me or steal from me or cheat on, or cheat from me or, or whatever you know it, it's like it's like how can we hold something against someone when we've been forgiven so much and so it, it changes the way that you see people when they wrong you and it all comes from just accepting the forgiveness and the mercy of God so that's what I mean when you realize that yes I have been Saul I have been Saul I have been the one who's needed forgiveness. I have been the one who's done everything wrong. And and God forgave me the way David forgave Saul. It gives you the ability to then go be merciful the way that David was for Saul, to other people. And so just to wrap it up in conclusion, I just want to point out this one, this one idea that I really spent a long time kind of meditating on with this verse. It's kind of a weird part. If you want to go back there with me... Um, it's, uh, it says in uh, it says in here that that David he, he 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 rose up and he cut the corner of Saul's robe off, and it, it seems a little bit weird because it's like what's the point of that? Was it just to prove that he was there? And I I don't really think so because he followed him out of the cave. He knew he was there, and I think that it's incredibly symbolic. I think that this is incredibly symbolic. I spent a lot of time praying about it. I spent a lot of time talking to Grace about it. And I think that what God is trying to say here is that our sin has consequences. Our sin has consequences. Saul's robe was damaged because he was because he sinned. And that might not seem like much. It's like, yeah, he cut my shirt. This was like a five dollar shirt. But like, you go back to ancient Israel, like we're talking the king, his robe was probably worth like a million dollars. It was a big deal that he would cut his robe. That's why David felt guilty about what he did. Because it was a it was a, an expensive robe, and so and so David or Saul's sin had a consequence, and our sin has a consequence too. But the reality of the situation is that you know if you kill someone, you're going to go to jail because our sin has consequences, and so and so the things around you, the things outside of you, are impacted by your sin. But if you have accepted what God has done for you through Jesus. No matter what you do, it may affect the things around you. It may affect your outside situation. It may be hard to restore that trust. It may be hard to restore that for, you know, to receive forgiveness. It may be hard for you to, um, you know, pay back the penalty that you've, that for, the, for the sin that you've done. But internally, there is nothing that can touch you. Your sin will never harm you. David did not harm Saul, and God will not harm you. If you have put your faith in Christ, the things around you may be affected by your sin. And the things around you may be damaged by your sin. But if your faith is in Christ, the inner you, your soul, who you are, does not have to be impacted by your sin. So in conclusion, I'm going to just wrap it up. And Grace, maybe you could play a worship song on TV. If I could have everybody stand, I just want to say a quick prayer. Um... I want to give you guys a chance to respond to what you just heard. So maybe maybe while I was talking, you would say, you know, I don't really know if I've ever received that mercy. I want to tell you that that's something you can receive today. And so with every, every everyone's eyes closed and everyone's head bowed, I just want you to take a moment and reflect and say, have I really taken the time to truly receive the mercy that God has given me? Maybe you think that you're David. Maybe you've spent your whole life thinking that you're this super righteous, super holy person. And you haven't really ever accepted the fact that, yes, you are Saul. Even if it wasn't now, at one point or another, you have been Saul. And so I want to ask um, Anthony and Grace to come back up here. Grace, you can start playing music. 
And so, um, with every eye closed and every head bowed, I just want to ask you, um, if you feel like you want to receive God's mercy for the first time again, you want to receive God's mercy for the first time again, or, or maybe you've received it before and you want to recommit yourself to receiving His mercy, with everyone's eyes closed and everyone's head bowed, I want you to just slip up your hand really quickly and just tell me, I want to recommit my life to God's mercy. I am Saul, and I'm not David, and I accept that fact, and, I, and I'm sorry. And so, God, we just thank you so much for this message. We thank you for this time that we get to spend together. And most of all, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you so much for your mercy, which is renewed every day. And so, and so as we leave, God, I just pray that you would remind us and encourage us that, that although we have not been uh, David, although we have not been the holy and righteous person that we like to think that we are, we recognize that although we are Saul, you are David, and you have forgiven us, and you have taken that punishment away from us. Um, and so, Jesus, we just ask that you would seal this moment. We just thank you so much for everything that you're doing in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you guys need prayer for anything at all, uh, Grace, I don't know if you left, so, so come see me, Grace, Doug, or, or Donna, if you want to pray. We're going to go back into a time of worship.